Her physician gave her a medication called thalidomide. Many of you remember the thalidomide babies. The doctors didn't know at the time that thalidomide does severe physical damage to the fetus. So when Tony was born, he was born without arms. The music that you heard him playing, he plays with his toes. As I mentioned earlier, Lent traditionally lasts 40 days. In commemoration of the 40 days that Jesus spent fasting in the wilderness, and during which he was tempted or tested by the devil. The wilderness is a very somber and lonely place. That wilderness was not one that he chose. In fact, when St. Mark tells us that Jesus, after his baptism, went into the wilderness, Mark uses the Greek word embalo. Embalo means he was impelled. He was forced by the Holy Spirit. He was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested for those 40 days. As is the case in every wilderness that he and you and I endure. We endure wildernesses not necessarily because we are Christians, but simply because we are human. And the wilderness seems to be inextricably bound with our humanity. My text for today is not out of the Gospels, even though I've been referring to the Gospels, the temptation in the wilderness. My text today comes from the book of Deuteronomy. I mentioned this on Friday during our Bible study. Some of you are here. Let me give you some backstory before I, re I read for you the text in Deuteronomy. Israel has been freed from Egyptian bondage. They were slaves in Egypt for generations and generations. And God sent Moses to lead his people, to lead God's people out of the wilderness. And in the process, because Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was not willing to let God's people go, God smote the Egyptians and Pharaoh with those ten plagues. The blood, the frogs, the vermin, the cattle disease, the hail, the darkness. Ultimately, the death of the firstborn. Moses then leads the children into that wilderness before they cross into the promised land. Now God had told Israel that he was going to lead them into the land of Canaan, into the land of Israel, now known as. But he wasn't going to just give it to them. They had to fight for it. <laughs> kind of sounds like you and me. God doesn't give us everything that we want or even everything that we need. We have to go and sometimes work for it. Well, Israel, in those 12 spies, remember the story, and they went across the Jordan, and they brought back huge pieces or, or, or branches of fruit. But they also brought back 10 of them, did a bad report. They said to all the congregation, yes, the land across the Jordan is flowing with milk and honey. And here's some of the fruit. But, there's always a but, isn't there? But there are giants in the land. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. The perspective is really important, especially when we come into those periods of testing, those periods of difficulty. Our perspectives teach us that God is, in fact, leading us, or no, God is not, in fact, leading us, nor protecting us. 
So because of the bad report of the 10 of the 12 spies, the only two spies who brought back the good report and said, yeah, it's true that these guys are giants, but God has given them into our hands. Who knows who those two spies were? Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb, very good. Joshua and Caleb. So that's the backdrop of what I'm about to read to you. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, Moses is recounting or retelling that story of, of the 12 sides. And this is what Moses writes. And this is our text for today. Yet you were not willing to go up, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord. Verse 27. And you grumbled in your tent and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. So what in the world were they thinking? They had just finished witnessing God's power. He had delivered them from Egyptian bondage Turn the Nile's blood, the frogs, and that's like I just talked about. And then when Pharaoh's army raced after Israel into the, into the Red Sea, the Red Sea closed on the Egyptian soldiers. Israel saw all of this, and it didn't take them a week. If you read the story in, in Exodus, it didn't take Israel a week to start grumbling that God didn't care about them. And here they're saying, it's because God hates us. What were they thinking? Perhaps they were thinking a little bit like we sometimes think when we are in our own deserts. And there are plenty of them. But I think the loneliest wilderness, the loneliest desert, is the one in which we think God doesn't care for us. God is ambivalent to us. Or at the very worst, God hates us. I remember many, many years ago, I was a brand new Christian. I, I told this story before, some of you may remember. I was really lonely. I wanted to get married. I was 24 years old, and I thought my life was going past me. And I was going to end up being 100 years old and still never get married. And I was really depressed. And I'm on this train, uh, taking me out of your coast. I was stationed in your coast of Japan. I was on this train, looking out the window. Very pastoral scene, a nice landscape. I saw some cows grazing, and nearly a cloudless sky. And I'm, my head is pressed up against the window pane as the train is passing through this scenery. And I said to God, don't you care about me? That's what I said. I still remember it. Don't you care about me? And suddenly, I had this, it was not a vision, as if I could see something like I'm seeing you. But it was as clear in my mind's eye as anything that has ever been in my mind's eye. And I was looking at the sky, and I saw a cross with somebody on it, spread out like this. And as I'm watching this scene, the cross with the person on it slowly turned, and I gave this so I'm just thinking about it. And I saw what I imagined Jesus looked like on the cross. And that was my answer. You know, God forgives me. I know God forgives me, but, you know, don't you care about me, God? And he showed me, yeah, I do. He showed me his son on that cross as I was shaking my fist in his face. Last week, week and a half ago, I was on vacation, many of you know, with my wife who went down to Orlando. And I met a good, good friend of mine. I've known Steve for um, six, I'm 67, at least 65 years. 
And so we had lunch together, he and Steve, Steve and I and Nancy. And the conversation, as it usually does whenever he and I get together for any length of time, turns to faith. Steve is not a believer by any stretch of the imagination. Steve likes to say he's at least an agnostic. And he challenges me every time we meet. If God exists, and God is good, then how can, and then he gives me a litany of all the things that have ever gone wrong on planet Earth. From the little child who contracts cancer, to the mother and father of three kids who are killed in a car accident, somebody runs into them, to the Holocaust, to ISIS today, ravaging through Christian lands and beheading Christians and burning them alive. If God is a God of love, then how can these kinds of things happen? Steve asked some really good questions. Reasonable questions that any reasonable person ought to ask. And I remember saying to him, Steve, I choose to look at all of life's events through the, I use the expression, love-colored glasses. But the more I thought about love-colored glasses as like, you know, rose-colored glasses, you put rose-colored glasses and everything looks rosy, but you take the glasses off and everything looks normal. But love-colored glasses can carry the same kind of idea. You take those glasses off and you see reality. And that's why I chose to change to looking through the eyes of love. Because, as I said to Steve, as I look through the eyes of love, I see things not in the physical reality, but I see things in the spiritual reality. Now before I go on, I want to answer the question that is often asked, well then how do you get to look through eyes of love? You can't just throw your wallet and put something on. It's been my experience walking with Christ for 40 some odd years, that to be able to do that, and listen to me, my brothers and sisters, listen to me, this is important. In order to look at the light around us, in order to look at the wildernesses around us, even those that we are in, in order to be able to look at those things through love, through the eyes of love, that is a gift of God. Nothing that I have done has granted me the ability to, at times, not always, I don't want you to think that I never get depressed, because I do. But I have, I'm learning to look at all of my life's experiences and the world's experiences through those eyes, and that's a gift of God. Nothing that I did has given to me except one thing. I have asked God to give me the grace to see everything that happens through those eyes. Jesus said, you remember, Matthew chapter 5, ask and you receive, seek and you'll find, knock and it'll be open to you. And when we study that in our Bible study, we learn that the Greek word that Jesus used here is a continuing presence. In other words, what Jesus was saying, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Because those who keep seeking, find. Those who keep asking, receive. And those who keep knocking, the door is open. And so if you take nothing else away from what I'm saying this afternoon, I hope you'll take this away. Keep asking God to look at your life and your wildernesses through the eyes of love. Keep seeking from God to be able to look through 
the eyes of love at the situations that we face. Keep knocking on that door. Every good gift, James tells us, St. James in his epistle, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of light, to whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God will give you, God will give you the grace, the gift of looking at your life situation through those eyes of love. Let me move on. Steve asked me how I could know that God is love despite all of the tragedies that have afflicted humanity ever since the garden. That's an easy answer. Because God tells us he loves us. God tells us he's a God of love. God tells us that everything he does is good and perfect from one end of Scripture to the other. For example, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 23, Jesus is now hanging on that cross. And he's going to be dead soon. He knows it. During Lent, many times we reflect on the seven last statements of Christ on the cross. The first statement that Jesus made on the cross that's recorded for us is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. First example of God's love for me and for you. Shaking our fists in God's face. And Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. Let's go back to the question of the deserts. Before we talk more about evidences of God's love for us from the scripture. I played the song for you by Tony Melendez. So little I take you. No hand. Does everything with his toes and his feet. Playing songs of worship to his God. Johnny Erickson Power, some of you may know the name. She was born in 1949. When she was 18 years old, she dove headfirst into the Chesapeake Bay. They were having a party. And she misjudged how deep the water was, and she broke her neck. And from that moment to this moment, she's still alive. She's been a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down, has lived her life ever since then. Yet, during her two years of rehabilitation, understandably, she experienced lots of anger, lots of depression, suicidal thoughts. Although, when you're quadriplegic, how do you commit suicide? And she had lots and lots of religious doubts. Her faith had been shaken to the core. But God walked her through that desperate wilderness. And she went on to write more than 40 books about God's love. She had recorded several musical albums about God's love. An autobiographical movie of her life was made demonstrating God's love in her wilderness. So the question is, did God hate Johnny Erickson? Did God hate Tony Melendez? Did God hate Fanny Crosby? We spoke about Fanny Crosby two weeks ago. The young woman, the woman who was born blind and went on to write hundreds of hymns that Christians around the world have been singing ever since she wrote them. Did God hate the person who had been born blind in John chapter 9? Did God hate the many lepers or the lame or the deaf? And more to the point, does God hate you? Despite or because of 
the illnesses, the chronic pain, the disappointments that you have experienced in your life, and still experience. The question is that you have to answer, and I have to answer, does God hate you and me? Who doesn't know the story of Job, one of the wealthiest men in his country? And in one fell swoop, he lost his fortune, he lost all seven of his children, he lost his health, all in the same hour. He didn't have a chance to catch his breath. And then his three friends, four, if you can't be lying, blame him. It's your sin, Job. That's why you're suffering. God's getting even with you. Don't you think the devil is quick to tell you and me it's because of your sin that you're suffering like this? It's because God doesn't care about you that you're suffering like this? God's ambivalent toward you? And yet Job chapter 13 said, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. His comment reminds me of what the Apostle Peter wrote in the fourth chapter of his first epistle. This is what St. Peter wrote. Therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Trust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Another way of saying that could be God help us to filter every square inch of our wilderness through the eyes of love and not through eyes that see things only with our physical senses. God help us to see things with the spiritual eyes that he has given to us and not the physical eyes. Why does God bring his children through the wilderness? Scripture lists several possible reasons. Discipline for our sins is one. Certainly God will discipline us if we're sinning. We expect, we want that to happen. Just like, just as our, as our earthly parents disciplined us when we did something wrong. We would expect, we would want our Heavenly Father to discipline us when we're going off track. That's one reason. Another reason is to strengthen our faith. You know the old story of the, of the baby bird and the, and the egg trying to crack through the egg with its beak? If we came along and helped crack the egg to help the bird get out, what happens to the bird? The bird dies. So when our faith is tested, God is strengthening our faith. Because life is not easy. And we need, we need to go to the, you've all probably seen the advertisements of Gold's Gym. I have no financial interest in Gold's Gym. I'm just mentioning it because they have a great marketing scheme. But I remember Gold's Gym. We need to go to God's Gym to get our faith strengthened. Another reason is to show us the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, the metal of our faith. What our faith is really made of. What kind of stuff is our faith made of? If we fall away from our faith at the slightest problem, then do we even have faith to begin with? Let me go back and share it with you because I'm looking at the time. Some of those other reasons why I believe, and you can believe, in God's love. And we can look at our wilderness through the eyes of love. Number one, Father, forgive him, I said. Number two, God never leaves us. God never leaves us. Not for a nanosecond. God never leaves us. He never takes his eye off of you or me. If a sparrow does not fall to the ground without our Father knowing it, 
Do we really think that God doesn't know where we are at every moment of every day of our lives? Matthew chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 13, and dozens of other passages. Too numerous to list here. There's not a Christian in the world even marginally familiar with the Bible who does not know what the Scripture says about God's presence with us wherever we might find ourselves, even in our most desperate wilderness. Isaiah 43, number 3, Isaiah 43, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, it doesn't say if, it says when. Because it's part, it is inextricably bound, like I said earlier. The wilderness is inextricably bound with our lives because we're human. But when we walk through these fires, through these floods, God is with us. Isaiah 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob. He could have just as easily have said. Listen to me, Steve. Listen to me, Anne. Listen to me, Vinny. Listen to me, Sarah. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your gray years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you, and I will bear you, and I will deliver you, even to your old age, even to your graying years. Isaiah 49, but Zion said, now you can insert your name there too, but Norma said, but Betty said, but Mary said, but Paul said, the Lord has forsaken me. Right there, Isaiah 49. Verse 14. The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Then God answers. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget thee. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Isn't that a wonderful promise and prophecy? 700 years before Jesus' hands were inscribed with your name and my name. Behold, I have inscribed your name on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Psalm 39. Weeping lasts only for the night. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. Romans chapter 8. One more and I'll just stop here. I am convinced, Paul says, I am convinced that, that nothing shall separate us from, the, from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Neither fears for today, nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can trust our God in our wilderness. We can trust him in the battle. He never, never, ever leaves us. Life is full of heartache, part of living. But Emmanuel, remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. Isaiah chapter, chapter 7. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and bring forth, and bring forth a son, and, and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us.
Calvary was not a benign death for God's Son. The Romans first, when they whipped him, we talked about this before, the cat of nine tails, those leather straps that were embedded with bone and rock. And so when the Roman soldiers swung the whip against the prisoner's back and pulled that whip away from the back, they pulled off strips of skin with each whip. By the end of the whipping, Jesus' his back and his buttocks and his legs were a mass of quivering flesh in many patients died from lack of from loss of blood simply from from the scourging. And then they forced him to carry that cross as best as he could. They had to impress someone else, Simon of Cyrene, to help Jesus carry that cross up to that hill, where they threw the cross down on the ground and threw Jesus on top of it, spread his hands out, his legs, and having those fights. Now we see oftentimes pictures of Jesus with the spikes in his hands and his palms. That's not where he was crucified. Because we know from Roman history that the weight of the prisoner, if the prisoner had been nailed through the palms, the weight of their body would have pulled their whole body off of the, off of the spikes and they'd have fallen to the ground. So what the Romans did was they took the spikes and, and, and nailed them in between the two bones here, the radius, radius and the ulnar bone. That way, their weight, the prisoner's weight, couldn't pull them free from the spikes. But there's a nerve. How many of you have ever hit your funny bone? Hi. You know how that hurts when you hit your funny bone? I hit my funny bone when we were on vacation. I hit it so bad I have never felt the pain like that in my entire life. I went down to my knees. I thought I could never get up. It hurts. It goes all the way up and down your arms. And so when the spikes went into Jesus' hands, or wrists, they also impinged on that nerve. And so waves of electricity ran up and down his arms. And he had to push himself off those feet just to breathe because of his diaphragm. If he didn't push himself up, the diaphragm couldn't go up and down. And that's how prisoners die, by the way. Prisoners die from suffocation. Because when, they, when the Romans broke the legs of the prisoners, the prisoners could no longer push themselves up to let the diaphragm go down so they can breathe. And so they suffocated to death. Calvary was not a benign death for Christ. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us, each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Isaiah 53. Let me conclude. God does not hate us. Simply. God is not ambivalent toward us. If God was even so ambivalent to the very least, if God was even to the very least ambivalent toward us, Calvary, where his son died a torturous death, would never have happened. Let me say that again. If there was even this much, one iota of ambivalence in God's heart for you and for me, this much ambivalence for us, Calvary would never have happened. God does not hate us. And consequently, we are really best advised to stop insisting that we must understand the infinite mind of God with our finite minds. We are best advised to stop insisting we understand God before we trust God And rather, let us 
seek the gift and the grace of God to entrust ourselves more and more, better and better as our days go on, entrust ourselves to our faithful Creator to always do what He always does, and that is He always does for us good, and what's right, and what's pure, and what's lovely. It's called looking at God with and through the eyes of love. 